privilege to be here today. Uh, of course, these celebrations are important. They're a reminder of our own landmarks, our own journey. And I hope studying Merton's spiritual art will help us to cherish and take more seriously our own journey and its potential stages. Um, today is Henry Nouwen's birthday. Uh, it's also the 70th birthday of a classmate of mine. I just sent a greeting before I got here today, and all year long, my generation, like my, my year, my uh, class, high school and grammar school, will be celebrating their 70th birthday, including me. So uh, it will be, well, yeah, it's a good reminder, you know, of, uh, of our journey and uh, our need to as assimilate and appropriate it, you know, as consciously as possible. Now, this theme of this Martin spiritual arc, I. I've, first mentioned it some years ago to the then head uh, of the uh, Merton Institute in Kentucky, the name escapes me right now, but he said, mm, I don't think anybody's ever done that, you know, despite all these congresses and, uh, and uh, yearly, you know, yearly assemblies. Um, you, should, you, should, you should apply you know, for the next congress, you know, whatever, and uh, you, know, you have to submit you know, papers and pressy and, and all. And, uh, uh, I realized that was not going to work out. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Merton scholar, for better or worse. Uh, I have shared Merton's life in the sense that my trajectory, you know, in more than 20 years in a silent contemplative monastery, you know, studying Zen, becoming a Zen master, Zen teacher myself, I have a lot in common. And a lot in common with, with the spiritual journeys that I've taken, that I've Maybe, maybe sensitive to <coughs> noticing the the, uh, the buoys on the sea, you know, the different marks uh, along the path uh, that he himself followed. Uh, so I did give this over th over three nights, uh, three weeks uh, at Saint Francis of Assisi Church, precisely uh, a few summers ago. So if you, that's online. So if you want to see the expanded version of this. Uh, uh, please feel free. I'm going to try and bring it down to one uh, one uh, lecture now. Uh, and it's uh, every time you talk about a, trying to apply a scheme, a schema to to someone's life, it's, it's going to be artificial. It's going to be procrustean in a certain sense. You know, stuffing in here and expanding here to fit into uh, a preconceived uh, pattern. Uh, so I apologize in, in advance for that. You may disagree completely with some of the things I say, or you, or you may be saying, "What about this? Or what about this comment at this time? Or what about this book?" And, well, okay, fair enough. It's not going to be, you know, that cut and dry. But I do think there is, you know, uh, a, a general clear arc that follows uh, in his life, that follows, as I said on the blurb, uh, both ancient and modern, uh, modern uh, patterns. Uh, uh, and uh, that's, what I'm, that's what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, this will also be, you know, Christine is, is generously uh, filming this from my, from my website. So it hasn't been a problem in the past, I've always done this, but if, if any of you in your comments or questions don't feel comfortable with that, uh, you, we can always let me know afterwards and I'll cut it out of the final version. But it hasn't been an issue uh, up to now. Um, <laughs> the overall arc, I think you can, in Merton's case, you can almost follow with the decades. So, you know, the first phase of the arc would be his, you know, his life all the way up to the publishing of Seven Story Mountain, in, you know, in the late 40s, and his life experience up to then. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have the 50s in that particular period, and then, of course, the explosion of, of new life and insight and, and energy uh, that he had in, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, his, his life was, was cut short. Uh, who knows where he would have gone from there, but we'll be, talk be talking a little bit about that. Now, the ancient version of this, and revived by people like uh, Reginald Garibu Levange at the beginning of the 19th century, is the famous ascetical theology, is the purgative way, the illuminative way, and the unitive way. And that's fair enough. You know, I think you can, 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, to be very broad about it. Um, uh, and what you see, and I'm going to be referring to other things, I'm going to re be referring to, especially to the stages of faith, which is, I think, a very clear application to Merton by James Fowler, 
uh, from the 80s, which I've used a number of times. I've, I've given conferences on this precisely itself, and I'll, we'll be using that. Uh, also applying uh, Ken Wilber's you know, famous you know, spiral dynamic levels and colors, as some of you may know that, and so I'll be referring to that just along, along the way as well. Uh, and, and finally, you know, uh, among the modern authors, uh, Richard Rohr, who's a great friend and mentor of mine, uh, uh, his schema for uh, male spiritual growth. You know, he's very much into uh, men's initiation rites, which I took myself some years ago, and his schema of how, especially the, the male spiritual arc, you know, the arc of a, of a man, uh, develops also fits, I believe, very well, as we'll see. So I'll be referring as we go along to each one of these. Hmm? Now, what you notice in, in that first part, culminating in his profession, his ordination, and the publishing of his book, you know, The Seven Story Mountain, uh, is that he completes that first stage of the, of the arc. He goes through the purification process, the conversion process, complete change, the embrace of a whole new way of the discovery of the riches and the beauty of the Catholic tradition, his own call to the monastery, his own call to the priesthood. Uh, it's a very profound and beautiful thing, and it, it's, it's the Pearl of Great Price. It's, it's, the, it's the treasure hidden in the field, and you sense that, 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 that huge enthusiasm and gratitude, you know, in his writing uh, of the story of Seven Story Mountain, which is, I think, part of the reason it's been so popular all through the decades since then. Uh, <laughs> And that is a really, really important stage of, any, of anyone's growth to discover one's fundamental call, to discover the riches of a particular tradition, and to plunge fully into that, uh, to discover one's own call, especially a, a radical call uh, like his. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, uh, he's obviously an intellectual, obviously a, a poet, obviously uh, an author, who then becomes a, a monk. <laughs> Everyone knows, and it's been said often, that Merton is not, uh, is not a monk who became a writer. He was a writer who became a monk, and he could not have survived without the writing. Now one couldn't have either, for maybe slightly different reasons, but we'll come back to that. Um, but he did, he did discover his, his vocation to, to, to the monastery and entered into it wholeheartedly. Uh, if you read, you know, sections of the Seven Story Mountain, I mean, you, you can see what are characteristics of this. It's the stage of faith, referring to Fowler, uh, beyond, you know, the mythical and literal stage that many people, unfortunately, do stay at uh, in their approach to faith. Uh, it's the synthetic conventional faith, level three, according to him, out of six, James Fowler. A synthetic conventional faith is what it sounds like. This is the tradition as it's handed on in its usual form, uh, and it's discovered and embraced and enthused about. Uh, uh, its riches are plumbed and understood, uh, but it's, it's conventional. It doesn't go beyond the usual categories you know, as, as handed on by tradition. Now, Ken Wilbur's book, speaking about this stage, uh, points out that most people spend their lives there. They don't move beyond that stage of faith. And you can actually, it can actually be a, even a mystic, you know, and not move beyond that stage of faith. Interestingly, as he points out. I think excellent examples of that are the Carmelites. St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Therese de Vizieux, the little flower. Uh, uh, they uh, clearly don't move beyond the, the, the Catholic cultural milieu in which in which they grew up and in which they flourished. And of course they were mystics, doctors of the church. So it's not that this is bad, but it is, it is a certain stage of faith. And at times, depending on your culture and on your own call, it can be a severe limitation. I don't think people can, could live in our world today, anywhere in our world today, the way the Spanish did in the 16th century. This is just not culturally possible, nor desirable. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, so it is. It is a, a, a particular, you know, stage of faith, and you can see it. You can see it uh, uh, reflected in in, in in the Seventh Story Mountain, for example. Very, very, very idealized view of the church, of the monastic life. And I, I know. I, you start there. You start there. You have to have a, an almost naive view in order really to embrace it. 
and uh, you know, and the riches are, are genuine. The riches are there, so it's, it's not an illusion. It's it's, it's not a mistake. You know? uh, but you know, uh, he has goes on for a couple of pages. You know, in the Seven Story Mountain about the, the monastic life, how pure and wonderful it is. Uh, they had nothing. They were the richest men in the world, possessing everything. Of course, that's Saint Paul. Uh, the Spirit of God entered in and filled the place that had been made for God, the poor brothers of God in their souls, that tasted within them the secret glory, the hidden manna, the infinite nourishment. You know, true, but wow. <laughs> That's not the whole story. As he found, as we'll see. You know. uh, but, but you do have to start there, uh, at that level. And, and similarly, or in contrast, you know, earlier in the book, he's speaking about Oriental mysticism, you know, and, you just follow the, the, the conventional theology of the time, especially for some of the French uh, theologians who were saying, of course, this is all just natural mysticism, and it's not, it's very limited, and it can even, you know, get you into trouble. So it had a very just negative, dismissive view of, 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 of the Asian and religious traditions, which fit the time, 40s, and fit his own evolution. I mean, he had to focus, focus more fully on, on the riches of Catholic tradition, as he discovered it. So you had, it's, it's a normal thing, and especially for a convert, which he was, as you know. Uh, you have what's called the fervor novici, the fervor of the novice, both in the technical sense of his monastic life, the fervor of the novice, but also the fervor of the convert, which, as you know, depending on the person and on the circumstances, can also be very dangerous, you know, very limited, uh, limiting. Uh, uh, but in, in his case, it, it flourished, uh, and uh, I was especially struck you know, in his, his, his description uh, in his uh, The Sign of Jonah, his description of these years. He spent a lot of time there talking about uh, his uh, stages of his monastic life. Like myself, he didn't say much about monastic profession, even his solemn vows, you know, which of course I took as well in the Carthusians. And both for him and for me, it was not nearly as memorable as the priestly ordination. Uh, I, I was struck, you know, at the time of my own ordination, reading, reading some of what he, what he said just before the ordination. In three days, if I'm alive, and if the archbishop doesn't fall down and break his leg, I shall be a priest. You know, like this is so beyond anything I could ever be worthy of or imagine for myself. <laughs> and, and, and afterwards, he says, I could not begin to explain the lot, to even begin to. Intimate that the beauty of these, of these uh, past three days, you know, uh, his first mass and his ordination, uh, I, I very much resonated with that because it was my own experience too. Um, uh, that that was an ex extremely memorable moment. Uh, of course, as you would expect, it's a, it's a great calling uh, of sublime beauty, uh, and that's very much you know reflected then in both in that diary and in the seven story now. Uh, and he was, of course, 34 then, in 1949, I was in the womb. Uh, <laughs> um, and he, he had, in a sense, this was a culmination, the seventh story about. Wow, he's now professed, he's found his vocation, he's ordained, he's in the monastery. And now what? See, a lot of people, and this is why most people spend their whole lives here at that level of faith. It's not the end. It's just the beginning. It's just the end of the purgative one, out of the three. It's just really a first culmination. Now, Richard Rohr, when he speaks about uh, this, this level, he calls it, you know, the first 30 years, normally, especially for a man. Uh, he calls it the heroic journey. You know, ages one to thirty-two. Right? It's the journey where it's a journey upward, because you're you're rising in the world, you're finding your place, uh, you're finding your, your vocation, you're finding your identity um, in that first initial stage, which is so crucial. Uh, it tends to be kind of ego-driven, but but that's okay, as Richard Rohr often explains. It's normal, you know, at that point, you know, to finding yourself as a self, as 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 distinct, as separate, as your particular role in the world. You're going to have, uh, unnecessarily, and in a healthy way, it should be lived healthily and can be lived in a healthy way, in your place. Hmm? But it's the container, not the content, 
uh, as Richard would say. Uh, you will see what I mean by that as we, as we go forward. It's the heroic journey, according to Jung. You know, it's when you're, you're, you're on your way, and well, actually it goes, goes deeper than that. It goes, it's the heroic night sea journey, as Jung says, if that's more into the 1950s, as we'll, as we'll see. But it is only the first stage of that, of a three, three-pronged journey, normally. Uh, but, but many people are content with that. Okay, I'm ordained a priest, and I know the catechism, and the creed, and I have my job, and I'm going to do it until I'm 75. And nobody's going to interrupt me or challenge me, or no, no book or event or anything is going to move me in any other kind of direction, even one that might seem to mature. But it will challenge me and will make me question. That's what people don't like. Certainly ego doesn't like. So most people, including most religious people and priests, and stay there. Don't bother me. I've got everything figured out. I'm only 32 or 34, but I've got it all figured out. And luckily, Merton knew that, as he says in the, in the epilogue of Seven Story Mountain, you know, all this God speaking to him, I'm going to take all this away from you, all that you think you are. And he knows, he knows that the mystical way is going to be more of a challenge than, than, than he's. Uh, has been experiencing up to there. And of course, the burnt man, you know, I'm not going to be reading a lot of texts of Merton since I think you're all Merton scholars and you know them as well as I do. Uh, but uh, the theme of the burnt man, which of course became literally true at the end of his life, uh, was an important thing. You have, this has to be burned, it has to be consumed in the flame, the living flame of love, as St. John of the Cross would say. So that's what has to come next. And as I was reminded, looking at the uh, very end of the book, uh, it says, Sit finis libri, non finis coerendi, which in Latin means, so let this be the end of the book, but not the end of seeking. That's exactly right. And that's what we all have to be able to say at that stage of our life. So this is the end of this stage, but let it not be the end of seeking. Neither my seeking nor God's seeking me, which of course is much more important. Mm -hmm. So that's the synthetic conventional faith, uh, which then had to be challenged. Or, no, you know, uh, Richard Rohr's problem is too. You don't abandon or deny or leave behind what, what, what you've built on, because you're building on it. You, you integrate it. So none of this is later denied, but it is nuanced and strengthened in ways, challenged in ways that, that are not always evident, certainly not evident to the person at, at the time. Otherwise, he or she couldn't live it the way it was meant to be lived, and with full heart and hope, faith, hope, and love. Hmm? But the very fact that his diary of those years uh, and into the 50s is called the sign of Jonah, the belly of the whale, the belly of, as he tells it himself, the belly of a paradox. That's what he experienced in the 1950s, among, you know, other things. but. It's also why you don't have as much writing. It's not so much. There's not so much in the in the in, in, in the book here. I mean, you, you can read his journals, of course, that were published much later. Uh, but there's not that much to say, you know, to the public at that time because he's going through his own. He's in the belly. He's in the belly of the whale, the belly of the paradox. Okay, now what? You know, of course, he had. Well, he began to discover more reality about his own limitations. He had a lot of physical problems, as you know. He was not a practical person. He was, he was certainly an intellectual. Uh, he, uh, of course, had easy difficulties with his abbot. So, you know, the great surrender and obedience to your, your superior. Yeah, right. you know, that was a, something he had to really question as he went on. And, and rightly so. I mean, we all do. We all experience that in monastic life, you know, the limitations. And even the limitations of obedience, not just in the sense that it's hard, but that it's questionable. It's infantilizing. You can't really, I mean, seriously. So you really have to, you really have to, to, to question that. Uh, and, you know, he had, you know, not exactly fist fights, but certainly, certainly verbal, verbal fights with, uh, with his, with his Adam James Fox uh, over those years and, and on, on through. Uh, and also, in lack of, we just saw the passage about the idealization of the, the monastic life, you know, have everything is perfect and holy and beautiful. Well, 
Uh, I quoted in my, in my longer course that there was a passage in, the, uh, in his journals from the 1950s, at uh, one point where one of the monks had a complete nervous breakdown and had to be carried out to the refectory. Uh, the monastic life can do that to you, especially the way it's been lived and planned, you know, lived and conceived over the centuries. Um, you know, with strange asceti asceticism and the denial of the, of the body and of, of activity, and, and um, it's very, very intense. Uh, and it can attract people that are trying to run away from life. Merton was certainly not, but but it, it can easily do that. Uh, one of my confreres in the, in the Carthusians uh, when I was in France said, uh, "We take sick people and make them sick." And unfortunately, that's true in many, many cases. So if you're already fragile and you go into a monastery, you're, you're not going to get less fragile, you're going to get more fragile. So that raises you know, the issue of the validity and, and the, the wisdom of the monastic life as lived. Uh, you know, it certainly raised it for him, for Merton, especially as he went into the 60s. But already these questions, you know, uh, how actually to live out you know who who I am, and, and how can I how can I appropriate it individually and reflect my way through it? You know, beyond the expectations of the system. That's why James Fowler calls this fourth level of faith the individuative reflective stage of faith, stage four, where you make it your own. Which doesn't mean you just take lock, lock stock and barrel everything from the tradition as you did originally. But you say, wait a minute, this, what is this really going to mean? What, should, what, what is the value of this really? And what is the value for me? Uh, what is God really calling me to? How, how can I really, how can I deepen my understanding of what this really signifies? You know, uh, so that's, that's the belly of the whale. It's the sign of Jonah. You know. Richard Rohr actually uses that, you know, in his men's rights of passage, he uses Job on the dung heap. He uses Jonah in the belly of the whale. And he uses Joseph, sold into Egypt and thrown into the pit before he's sold to the, to the Egyptians, uh, to the traders. Um, so there is that going down into the hole. And of course, here you join John of the Cross with you know, the dark nights of various kinds. Uh, as my original jo Jesuit novice master said, you know, it's not always that clearly schematic. You, know? you enter into a dark night, which eventually you get used to, and it becomes light. You know? kind of divine light is dark at first. And, it becomes light. So uh, as you get deeper into the divine life, your whole sensibility is changed and purified. Uh, your spiritual gluttony and spiritual greed and all of that down the process gets, gets purified out. So it's a purification process, but it's an illumination process. The divine light is what's doing it. That's why it's called the illuminative way, the second stage, where the divine light becomes more and more real uh, and inevitably relativizes everything in your ego and everything in the system cannot be perfectly, can never be perfectly reflected in the divine light because it's the system. And the divine light is infinite and infinitely great, great, great infinitely uh, subtle. Uh, and cannot be talked about procrastinating, cannot be forced into any, 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 any system. Um, we see that in the life of Jesus, of course, and we're supposed to be following after all. But he just cannot be contained in any political or religious system. And the fact that we are so easily contained within a political or religious system throughout the centuries is a very, very bad sign for our own spiritual maturity as a community and as individuals. So this stage really is, for most people in most cultures, really essential that we go through this, this new illumination. Uh, and ultimately, uh, it leads to what John the Cross calls the dark night of the soul, which kind of transition into the third stage. Uh, and what it really is, John the Cross, again, because of his culture, speaks of it more in terms of you see how unworthy, absolutely unworthy you, you are. What it comes down to in modern terms is that the ego is dethroned. The ego is uh, vanishes. The ego, you, know, you lose your whole identity. You discover your real identity. Which shouldn't be a surprise because Jesus said as much. Whoever will try to preserve it, his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will, will find it. What do you think he's talking about? 
The metanoia is your whole consciousness changes. That's what the word means, metanoia. It doesn't mean repentance. It means change your whole outlook. Get beyond your mind. Those are different ways of translating that first phrase of Jesus when he starts preaching. The kingdom of God is here. Change your whole outlook. And what it comes down to in modern psychological and spiritual terms is, is the ego uh, is no longer in charge. And that's what you learn in Belly and the Whale. Surrender! Your own intellect and your own your own will and your own vision of things and you know, everything you thought has to be called into question, relativized and put into a, a new, newer perspective because the further you get in the divine light, uh, the more it's darkness to our ordinary eyes and our ordinary systems. And, and the more that, uh, that, that, that goes forward you know, to a whole new, a whole new perspective. Mm -hmm. So all of those things have to be questioned, and even his own life. I think, I think to me the most famous uh, uh, of his uh, phrases, uh, the famous, the famous uh, text is often used uh, from Thoughts in Solitude, My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going, I do not see the road ahead of me, I cannot know for certain where it will end, I don't know myself, the fact that I think I'm following your will doesn't mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe the desire to please you does in fact please you. I hope that I have that desire. You know, so you, you see this, this, and it, it's, it's beautiful and it's normal and it's necessary to go through that. You know, I have no idea what's going on anymore. Uh, and uh, all my old certainties, you know, have to be you know, called into question. In, this, in, the, spiritual, in the spiritual journey uh, by, by Richard Rohr, he calls it, uh, he calls it after you've reached a certain level of self-identity that we spoke of earlier, he says there's a crisis of limitation between the age of 35 and 50, which again fits Merton. Uh, uh, Midlife crisis, basically. So everybody goes through this, even outside the realm of faith and religion. You reach a certain level in life, and then you say, okay, now what? And is this it? And who am I really? Is this all? And it's really a really necessary stage, of, and often people make radical changes in their lives uh, at that point. Uh, as, as, well, hopefully as they're growing. Uh, there's uh, an inner loss of meaning, and sometimes accompanied by failure. Well, that's really important, too, especially when you talk about Henry. Uh, try to can't gain power and control. You're confront confronted with your limits, with paradox, with mystery. This is when you be finally begin to get comfortable with not knowing. I don't know where I'm going, or, uh, where you're comfortable with paradox and mystery. And you have to be, because life and God are paradox and mystery, for heaven's sake. If you think you have all the answers, or you even think you want all the answers, you're in serious trouble. Because you don't, and you can't, and you shouldn't. So much bigger than all of that. So the cross. Heroic virtues don't work anymore, the heroic journey, you know, virtue, the, heroic, the fact that we tickle about, talk about heroic sanctity is not a good phrase. Uh, these don't help. You need humility, honesty. So early movement from self-control to the beginnings of God control. And again, that's where the ego has to let go of its control, or its illusion of control. The first great truth that you learn in the men's rites of passage is, you're not in control. Life is hard, it's not about you. You're gonna die, it's, you know, you're not that important. All those things that dethrone the ego are where you have to go through. And then you can begin to get those lights as, as the dark night finally gets, you become used to the light, used to the dark, or the divine ray of darkness, as, as, as Dennis the Aronopic guy said. Um, you can begin to see the richer light, the deeper light that you are. And here's where we come to Fourth and Walnut. Okay. Fourth and Walnut, as you know, is one of his great mystical experiences, at least as recorded. Uh, was very famous in March of 1958. Um, it's interesting, though. If you, yeah, if you go to his journal, it was published much later, and go to that page, it's like, I don't know, one paragraph? And then he goes off into talking about how he was attracted to women on the street. So, wait a minute. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, when he redacted it and published it in Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander in the mid-60s, it's the whole, he, he elaborates the vision much more fully, because he could then. 
because he passed, he passed beyond that, you know, that, that stage to, uh, as the illuminative gets richer and richer to, to a more unitive vision. It's not just unitive with God, it's unitive with oneself and with the universe. Uh, that's what unitive way means. And that's what he came to. So that, uh, that fifth stage, that unitive way, that fifth stage of faith, according to Fowler, is uh, integrated faith. Where uh, the paradoxes come together, the, 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 the uh, what, what the Catholic tradition calls coincidentia oppositorum, the union of opposites, you know, or dark and light, life and death, poverty and wealth, you know, uh, all, all, all these, these seeming uh, opposites suddenly you know, come together. Uh, what, uh, what Jung calls mysterium conjunctionis, the, the mystery of, of union. Um, so it, it's in all the traditions that you find this union of of human and divine, of infinite and finite, very Zen, by the way, uh, which is why you know, one reason he was able to recognize the wisdom of that tradition as, as he went forward. Uh, so as you may remember, he, he speaks about, he's quoted in an article by Cynthia Bourgeau across currents 10 years ago, uh, and I think this is worth, worth reading. It's as if I suddenly, this is worth a walnut, it's as if I suddenly saw the secret beauty of their hearts, of everybody. The depths of their hearts where neither sin nor desire nor self-knowledge can reach. The core of their reality. Le point vierge. I can't translate it. It says in German. At the center of our being is a point of nothingness. Nothingness. It's no thing. The ego's gone. The separation is gone. A point or spark which belongs entirely to God, which is never at our disposal. No, no control, even no control here. From which God disposes of our lives, which is inaccessible to the fantasies of our own mind or the brutalities of our own will. So if you have a strong will, give it up. It's going to get in your way. This little point of nothingness and of absolute poverty is the pure glory of God in us. Poverty of riches. It is, so to speak, his name written in us as our poverty, our intelligence, our dependence, as our sonship. It's like a pure diamond, also a Buddhist image, a pure diamond blazing with the invisible light of heaven. It is in everybody. Everybody, not just Catholics. <laughs> and if we could see it, we would see these billions of points of light coming together in the face and blaze of the sun that would make all the darkness and cruelty of life vanish completely. Wow. One blazing sun, all the lights come together. We're not separate from one another, nor from God. It's just one blazing sun. S-O-N-S-U-N. So that's what he came to, and that's what we should be coming to. Of course, we have to be faithful to the, to the stages as we go forward. Uh, we, can, we could all become old fools, as Richard said. And this is the only time I'm going to mention him today, and whatever you think is of the politics, but the individual, there's no clear indication of a completely ruined life in terms of evolution as President Trump. <laughs> Tries to keep ascending, 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 get more, more and more victory, more and more power, more and more money, Exchange like a, like a new car every 15 years for a new wife, you know, and it's, uh, it's just really, really, really pathetic. We should be so grateful that we have that example before us of how exactly not to live your life. <laughs> Enough. All right. So, so if you go forward on a wisdom journey, as Thomas Hearn does, you come to this sense of, of, of unity. And of oneness with everyone and oneness with everything. So he was, you know, he was, he was, you know, biting at the whip. You know, he was gnashing his teeth, you know, trying, moving out, you know, from from the confines of of, of the of the, uh, of the of the monastic life. He, he found his place in, you know, where he could write and think and meet people in his hermitage. Of course, that was 
uh, uh, pretty good solution uh, for the time. Um, and recognizing that we're one with everyone, as, as he says, in the, we're, 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 I'm one with all these people. They're me. So, concern about peace, concern about civil rights, uh, concern about faith and violence, uh, all those great books and, and themes that he addressed in the early 60s fit the, fit the time, fit the culture very well too. That was the way the church and, and, and the country and the world was moving, uh, but he fit right into that. And he realized that he had to speak on that, that he had to, had to bring that into his heart. It was already in his heart. He had to discover it there. He had to respond to it there. He had to, to, be, uh, to be one with it and to live with that integrity and with that consciousness. Hmm? And then, of course, the interfaith comes into that, too. When you have this degree of, of, of experience, you can, you, can see, you can see it reflected in other traditions as well. So whereas before, as we saw earlier, he didn't have, he just had a, a conventional theology of the time when it came to understanding Eastern religions, and unfortunately that's still where many people are. Uh, but after the council and, and after all the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, progress of our own time and the, and the religious, religious experience and the common religious experience that I've been very much involved with myself, you know, we can see you know, that something more, something more is going on here. Mm -hmm. Now let me just say, I, Merton wanted to be a Carthusian, as you probably know, it's there in the sign of Jonah and, and uh, other places, and uh, so did St. Ignatius, so did John of the Cross. I went in and became one, uh, but uh, it tends to be very idealized. And in the order, we made, you know, good-natured jokes about what a total disaster Merton would have been in as a Carthusian, uh, only because he needed to write, and that was not a good commitment. Mm -hmm. So, luckily for Merton, he did not become a Carthusian. Um, and he has some, some ripe things to say about the Carthusians in America at the very end of his journal, just recently, fairly, just not long before he died about the million, two million dollar monastery they were building. And he says, hey, you know, I, uh, I suppose I can admire in a certain way. They're holding on to their ancient customs. But in the end, I find them a little ridiculous. <laughs> well, I'm here now, so. <laughs> um, but the other thing is about Zen. You know, he, he uh, Again, fitting the time in the 50s and 60s, you know, D.T. Suzuki he was comparing from one of the first from Japan to come and speak about Zen in, in the U.S. Very intellectual, talking about Meister Eckhart, is perhaps good correspondence from our from our from our Catholic tradition. Um, uh, but if you read Merton's journals, uh, his even his trip to the East, and I took my first trip to in the East, and it was to Bangkok as well um, some years ago, but. Uh, his talks with the Dalai Lama are so intellectual. Oh my God! So he was an intellectual. He was certainly contemplative, and we'll speak in a few seconds about, about his final experience on his Asian on his Asian trip. Uh, but but he stayed very much. He was a teacher. He stayed very much. He was a, very much an intellectual all through his life, uh, and he never went on the actual Zen journey in terms of joining a community or being under the, under the auspices of a teacher who would challenge him and push him every day, you know, to, and he couldn't, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, his, it wasn't his lifestyle, it wouldn't have been possible. But, but, but the result is that he, he was not uh, an enlightened Zen practitioner. I mean, he loved Zen. Everything he wrote about it, by the way, you know, is accurate and, and profound. It's just very well said. There's nothing wrong. But in terms of his own journey, he didn't take it. He didn't take it. And no fault of his. But what he did is that he did appreciate it. He wrote books about it that are very perceptive and, and moved people in that direction to uh, not only to appreciate it, but perhaps to practice it on their own. One of the uh, most telling things, of course, was his, uh, his, uh, his final vision in, in, in Sri Lanka of the statues, you may remember the, remember the, uh, the text, when where he speaks of it. Uh, looking at these figures, I was suddenly, almost forcibly jerked clean out of the habitual half-tide vision of things, and an inner clearness, clarity, as if exploding from the rocks themselves became evident and obvious. 
queer evidence of the reclining figure, the smile, the sad smile of Ananda, uh, the Buddha's disciple, standing with arms folded. Uh, the thing about all this is that there is no puzzle, no problem, no mystery. All, all problems are resolved. Everything is clear, simply because what matters is clear. The rock, all matter, all life is charged with Dharmakaya, which is a technical term meaning the, the, the body of the Buddha in its, in its, in its unmanifest form. Uh, you would say the cosmic Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is emptiness, and everything is compassion, which is what it does come down to. Everything is compassion. Nothing is separated. That's what emptiness means. No one thing is one thing. Everything is connected. No thing. Nothing. I don't know what in my life, where, when in my life I have ever seen, had such a sense of beauty and spiritual validity running together in one aesthetic illumination. That's interesting. One aesthetic illumination. Even he is saying that this was maybe on that level. Was that a Satori experience, an enlightenment experience that a Zen master would, would certify? I don't know, you would have to have a Zen master there to examine one. Maybe it was just this great recognition, you know, a, a great revelation, but not yet exactly an illumination in that stricter sense. It, it, it doesn't really matter in the end. And where he would have gone with this, who knows? It's cut short, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, what he did see, that they saw, that what the Buddhists and the Hindus and the others see, or what its ultimate reality, Dharma Kaya, Cosmic Christ, whatever you want to call it. You can approach it from different levels, call it different things, different angles. There's only one reality. If we can all access. You can develop a theology if you want, develop it's, it's, it's the Holy Spirit, and whatever name you give it, fine, fine. But it is accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. And requires this level of commitment and this level of letting go. Which brings me to just a quick mention of the sixth stage for James Fowler after the, the integrated faith. It's called universalist, universalizing faith, which he says very few people come to, and only those who willingly give their lives. I mean, really lay down their lives. And of course, he mentions you know people like uh, Gandhi and uh, uh, the King. And, uh, but he does mention that it's a possibility there to achieve that kind of universalizing vision where his whole life is given to this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's uh, the uh, for for Richard Rohr uh, this uh, this level of, of wisdom journey. Is, uh, is the way down, falling upward, where you go down into this nothingness, into this depth, uh, where you lose yourself to find yourself. Uh, needing spiritual guidance, the rules no longer work in their old form, letting go, trust, patience, surrender, abandonment, compassion, the dark night of faith, the Abrahamic journey. Finally secure enough to be insecure. How many of us can say that? Finally secure enough to be insecure. Uh, painful insights, major surgery, when not just physical but spiritual. Uh, redefining victory and success, putting on the mind of Christ, exactly. The Paschal Mystery, death and resurrection. You can't fake it anymore. Prayer means survival. The shadow is not just tolerated but embraced in Jungian terms. Nothing is left out. Uh, rejected stone becomes the cornerstone. Whereas the first part of the spiritual journey is sacrifice instead of mercy. Now, mercy instead of sacrifice, which is what, of course, Jesus said himself. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So you become a holy fool. Not an old fool, a young fool, but a holy fool. God's beloved child. <clears throat> Paradox is coming together. God is finally in control. Return to simplicity, the garden. So it's return to paradise. Or where beyond separation, no more tree of knowledge of good and evil, uh, but rather a tree of life. Um, being human, more important than self image, role, power, prestige, or possessions. So all that's left behind. He has it all. 
because he has no name. And he is no name. Thomas Keating said that at the end, too. Resemble God by being nothing, having nothing, knowing nothing. And uh, I think as I say, you do find similar stages in, in Wilbur, where you become more individual, that's stage four faith, and then we branch out into a more universal uh, Advaita or the non-dualistic stage, uh, which is this final unit of stage that we're talking about. Uh, I'm thinking that uh, before I add a little bit about M. Henry now and compare it a little bit here, maybe uh, it would be a good time to uh, any comments or, or questions on this that we've covered so far. I know it's a lot to, <laughs> to take in. Yeah. It's a limited question, of course it has to be. But I want to talk about Teresa Bruzio for one minute. Yes. You say she is a mystic. Oh, yes. But that in itself was limited. No, not the mystic part. The, the, the faith that she was able to articulate to herself was in conventional terms. So she couldn't go, go beyond. Not in her mind. But she did go beyond because she surrendered. Remember? Right. She just lets go. She's the little child. She doesn't know anything. But, you know, but in terms of her of the self-understanding or religious understanding, she didn't go beyond the conventions at the time. But it didn't mean that her soul did not, that her heart did not. Uh, I think that's important. Thank you. Yes? He's very much on that. Foundations and principles. Especially for the effort, he's talking about this holy indifference. Yeah. Like a long life, a short life, a poverty, a riches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's certainly a. That's so he comes down to God. Yeah, I think it's a. It's, don't forget, that's the principle and foundation. You know, that, that's where you start there. It's, start. it's kind of like where people maybe finally wind up. But that's kind of where it is, is, uh, is presupposition for doing the spiritual exercise, is that you actually be like a, on a scale. Whatever God blows the scale, you don't have your own preference and you don't have your own vision of things. So it's a very mature attitude, actually. But in, in a sense, it's needed for, for God to inspire us to do His will, and not, not our will. Uh, and I think, you know, Ignatius himself does fit into the 16th century cat Spanish category of someone who's, if you read the exercises, it's clear. But he's very much in you know, the conventional faith in, in terms of his articulation, which again, as I say, is okay. But, you know, sure. Um, do you think if uh, Merton had not died at what, age 53, mm. and the way you describe how he wrote about Zen, yes. uh, that had he lived longer, do you think that he would have moved gradually into perhaps exploring the practicing of, of Zen? Who knows? He might have, yes. Uh, especially if he, had, if he had become a hermit somewhere else, as he, one of his possible plans, as you know from his journey, yeah. was, was to do that. Um, who knows what he actually would have done. Uh, but maybe that would have become a part of it. Who knows? You know? But um, he certainly achieved an enormous level of maturity uh, as it is, and made a great contribution even to the understanding of Zen for, for, for Catholics and you know, when I read him, he, he still, what amazes me is how human he oh, is. Well, I'm going to come to that at the very end tonight, today. Okay. Yeah. At, the, at one moment, I'll be in tears, and the next moment, he's got me laughing. Yes, right. He's uh, very much that. Um, and I'm going, to, I'll, I'll, I'm going to actually conclude on that, though, uh, with, also with Henry now and, uh, in just a few minutes. Anyone else before we go further? Yes, David. Uh, so you can come in and uh, voice a comment from the years ago. Uh, you speak up a little bit. I've been at a conference many, uh, several conferences many years ago where there was none uh, attending who was at the Bangkok conference of the Jedi and helped him hear his body, she said. And that question came up, and she was certain that he would not have transitioned as the question was at the time. Oh, I don't mean, uh, I don't know. I don't believe that he would have. God and become a Zen monk or, or, or change his life. No, no, I don't, I don't believe that's true. But who, I mean, who knows? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address that issue in just a second. But, but uh, uh, relating it to Henry as well. Uh, no, I, it, it's, it's evident too. You know, he questions everything at this point. I mean, for example, the, uh, his affair with the nurse. Uh, and if you read his journal, he has pages and pages and pages on this. And he says, I'm not apologizing for this. I'm sorry. I'm not apologizing for this love. 
which is really fascinating. You know, you have that incredible freedom, you know, uh, when, you, when you reach that level. But at the same time, he clearly chose to stay within his own commitment, you know, as a monk and a priest, you know, within the structure. And, and that's also, uh, um, you know, it was his, his way, his integrity, his, 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 his path. Uh, so, it, again, these paradoxes, you know, with, with, uh, with, 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 with that one another in the same person. Yes? Two things I just wanted to uh, note from what you were saying, how much what you've been talking about fits very nicely with what I know about trying to work in 12 step programs. Oh, yes. Um, there's little places where you could have just gone one more step and said something there, but it very dovetails nicely. And then, second, when you were talking about the person who would not be named, I thought of uh, uh, the, a quote by uh, Anthony DeMello uh, Be grateful for your sin. But that's how grace breaks through. Yes. Uh, Leonard Cohen, you know, there's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. Richard Rohr quotes that a lot, and it's, it's, it's very true. That's why that's where surrender comes in. You don't, you don't reach God by, to quote Richard again, you don't reach God by doing it right, as if you could. You reach God by doing it wrong. I like St. Paul, who did everything wrong and then realized, oh God, oh my God, God is giving me mercy anyway, and God chose me anyway, despite the fact that I was a persecutor and a murderer. So you know, it, it has to be something similar in all of us where we realize God loves you no matter what you do or what you don't do. And that's the source of all then of morality. So you, it's not because you're moral you can become a mystic and have the experience of God. You have the experience of God absolutely unmerited and then you become moral as a result of that in the sense of compassion and loving, joyous, faithful, uh, all those things which you could never do by your own willpower anyway. Uh, that's really a really important point. That's going to come up also when you're talking about now and very much human weakness and its role in the spiritual life. Basically, Paul put it best. I mean, it's cross the press. I mean, here we worship a, a suffering, you know, tortured man, and, and that's, that's humanity. We've turned it into all sorts of atonement theories and stuff, but that's basically it. It's, it's a tortured, uh, failing, weak man that's, that's the image of humanity. And, he embraces that in us, and we embrace that in him, and we're able to go forward uh, in mercy and compassion, receiving it and then giving it to one another uh, through the power of the Spirit within us. Um, Paul said it best when he says, you know, aha, aha, it's when I'm weak that I'm strong. So I'm going to rejoice in my weakness so that the power of Christ can, can dwell within me. How many of us have followed that in history? Uh, that we rejoice in our weakness as the way God's light comes through. Mm -hmm. So maybe that does mean, why don't I just finish uh, then with bringing in a little bit of Henry Now. Now I'm not at all a, an authority or kind of sir. Henry Now, the only book that I read of him was that one of his last ones there, that beautiful one on the prodigal son. Um, a few years ago, Cardinal Dolan sent as a Christmas present to all of his priests, uh, a beautiful framed, uh, it was the year of mercy, framed by Pope Francis. Uh, framed a picture of that, which I have on my shelf in front of the, the books by Henry Now. Um, but I did, you know, recently read uh, a very good biography of his uh, by Michael Ford, the wounded prophet, uh, and got a sense of his, of his life uh, and, and journey. And here, and here we can have our own opinions here, Alex. I haven't, I haven't thought deeply about it, but I, I do see a, a number of correspondences. Uh, let me get out of the way first. I totally agree with John Hughes Bamberger that now it is not another Merton. Merton is on a, uh, at, a, at a level that, that no one can, can approach. You know, uh, John Hughes said, you know, anyone who thinks now is another Merton didn't know now and didn't know Merton. Uh, and I, I agree. I remember at the time in the 70s and 80s when I was in the monastery and reading some of the stuff about the Genesee Diary and stuff like that, that I said, this, this guy is not real. Um, and he admits it himself, that he, he found that type of prayer, that type of life, very difficult. But then that was his gift. That, you know, he, he had his human limitations and his human failings. Uh, he was, as you probably know, just pure, raw humanity. Flailing his arms, you know, and his heart all over the place. And it was his great gift because he could offer that to people. He was so interested in people and wanted to share himself and share their lives. And that was a great, great gift that he gave to people, both in his books and then in his daily life. But it was also what killed him and wore him out in the end, you know, 
of the heart attack. Also too young. Neither of them reached 70, so we got a bunch of them. By far, I mean, Merton, not even very near. Uh, and Henry was 64, barely. Uh, so, uh, but that said, you know, there, there are certain correspondences between them. Um, first of all, they're both writers, as I intimated before, but not for the same reason as I can see it. Uh, Merton wrote because he was a writer, that he, uh, you know, a poet intellectually shared all those things. Uh, uh, from what I can see, uh, uh, Nowen wrote uh, as a way of clarifying his own thoughts and his own feelings and then being able to share that with others. But it was a more of a therapeutic thing for him than it was, say, for Merton. Uh, uh, they're both teachers, Merton by his books and, and by his monastic conferences, you know, as a novice master. Um, and, of course, as you just heard, you know, Nowen was uh, at Yale and Harvard and, you know, it was, even though he didn't have, technically have a doctorate, you know, he was, he was so well received and loved uh, there uh, and so talented, you know, in, in engaging people and, and speaking to people. And it fit the time, speaking of the times, it fit the time because in the, in the 70s and 80s, you know, the youth and the universities, you know, were all open to all sorts of stuff and very lively. Um, and uh, he went to South America to delve into that culture, uh, and again, in the 70s and 80s with, with, a lot of old, with all the revolutions and, and things going on there. So he was really, really engaged in, in that. Um, and that, I think, is, is, is the most important, to my mind, at this point, the most important correspondence between the two is that they both were open to all sorts of changes in their lives as they grew and as they, as they moved forward. But they, you know, just would give up everything and try something new. You know, that happened, you know, when he entered the monastery, it happened when he, when he, you know, went off to Asia, it happened in different stages of his own life. Um, and then, uh, and then of, of course, Henry Nowen doing something very similar when he uh, left academia. He was a, had a tenured professor at Yale, and he gave all that up to, to go to Genesee and to, to, to South America, and then to, to Lash in the last 10 years of his life when he so, he realized that that testimony to human weakness and human need, uh, he could best live that out among people who were manifested uh, in, need, in human need, in, in, with, with limitations. And that kind of weakness and that kind of luminosity that comes from people of that kind that all our own personalities and, and talents don't get in the way, just that, that pure light that, he, that Merton spoke about in the plan Vierge that he saw at the center of everyone, that's what now and saw in, in, in everyone, and, and he could accept, they were his teachers, as he said, as well as he being their pastor and their teacher, because they were on that level of, of the weakness and vulnerability, the rawness of the human experience, the, the utter need, the vulnerability. Uh, he had that, and he recognized it in them, and the different modalities of it, but they were, they embraced each other very deeply and profoundly, and that was a great gift. Uh, you could see, I, I don't see the same clear arc in his life that I do. And I don't see it the same classic where he was always kind of just raw there and fully there. Uh, uh, even though he was ordained before Vatican II, he, he had a very liberal view almost from the start, it seems to me, about intercommunion, for example, that it got him into trouble with John Hughes. And uh, so that, so that uh, he always had a very open mind. It was, it was the humanity which, 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 which shone through. But an, an incredible neediness, and he went through his own speaking about nervous breakdowns in the monastery. As you know, he went through his own nervous breakdown when a friendship of his, you know, didn't fully um, satisfy his need, and when and, uh, and when he was dealing with his own, you know, inner need to be loved and esteemed. And here, here I do need to bring up something which is still very raw in our own in our own church. Uh, is homosexuality in the priesthood. Now, probably some of you have seen already, this, precisely this week, the cover article in New York Magazine uh, is on gay priests and self-loathing in the church uh, by Andrew Sullivan. It's a very, very perceptive article and very thorough. Uh, I do recommend it to you, but I, uh, my suspicion is that uh, beyond, he was a psychologist too, Henry Nowen, he, he could recognize the parental issues and he spoke about them as distant father and all stuff, but uh, what he was rust rust wrestling with and struggling with his, his whole life, something which Merton didn't know at all, 
uh, was his own homosexuality, his own sexuality, how to live that out, how to be faithful to his commitment, uh, to his, his calling, and yet also to, to embrace in his own sexuality in a healthy way. And uh, I don't think he ever resolved that. Uh, would he have as he moved forward? You know, where would they have gone in this? Uh, one of the uh, quotes at the very end of the book here is a, is a quote from now and at the end of his very end of his life. He says, since I am in my 60s, new thoughts, feelings, emotions, and passions have arisen within me that are not at all in line with my previous thoughts, feelings, emotions, and passions. So I find myself asking, what is my responsibility to the world around me? What is my responsibility to myself? Well, Merton could be right at this. Um, what does it mean to be faithful to my vocation? Does it require that I be consistent with my earlier way of living or thinking? Or does it ask for the courage to move in a new direction? Even when doing so may be disappointing to some people. Well, that's the question. Where is God really calling anyone of us? Uh, in new directions or to reaffirm old directions? We just talked about that in Merton's case a few minutes ago. Same thing is presenting itself explicitly here for, for, uh, for Henry Nowlin. Uh, at least he seemed to be aware of his, his sexuality and he had you know, varying reactions to it and then other people as well. He became more accepting of people in their relationships as, as, as he went on. Um, but it is still a major issue. This would be a whole new lecture, of course. I don't want to spend too much time on it. But, but uh, it is a major issue that's still in the church today. For those closeted, most priests are gay, uh, in case you didn't know. Um, and the article points that out. Uh, so, what is with that? You know, and part of it is the gifts that, that is in, across cultures and across generations and across the millennia that, that, that gay people have brought to spirituality and to service and, and aesthetics and things like that. That's a great reason why. Uh, and it's not just a place to hide, you know, it's, it's a place to serve. Uh, but if, if, if a person remains closeted and homophobic towards himself in the priesthood, that's what's most dangerous. They can go way wrong, as we see in the Karak. Uh, but as we know also, homosexuality and then the sex scandal are separate issues you know, in themselves. That's not the cause. Uh, but it can be very unhealthy. And those who are closeted uh, tend to manifest that by being very rigid. Very rigid, and not just in their own lives, but in, in their pastoral ministry, in their attitudes, in their theology. Anytime you see someone who's so rigid, you can be sure they're probably positive. Okay. And or engage in addictive behavior of food, work, drink, whatever, uh, as a way of escaping. Uh, that's what's really unhealthy. So we do have to come to a point, just as Henry Nowen had to struggle and try and come to a point where you can integrate it, uh, and as Andrew Sullivan says in his article, you can integrate it in a healthy way. Um, we're not anywhere near that at this point, uh, but Henry Nowen is a good example of uh, what needs to be done still in the church in this particular issue. So we need to grow and there as he needed to continue to grow in, in that sphere. So I, so I don't want to you know, get into a whole discussion of this particular issue, but it was very strong, very, very major force, if not the major force in, in in, uh, in Henry Nowen's psychological life and even in his spiritual life to a certain extent. But it's out of that woundedness, wounded prophet, wounded healer, out of that woundedness that he was able to, to share and be vulnerable and open uh, to others' vulnerability, which is also part of what a gay priest does as well because of the vulnerability and the hatred and all of that, the marginalization coming from all sectors, uh, that he's, he's able to respond to that vulnerability and marginalization in others as well, and compassion. So uh, it's an interesting dynamic uh, that's, that is really part of the current church's spiritual growth uh, challenge uh, and individual's growth challenge as well. And of course, for all of us, <laughs> sexuality and spirituality are one of the major things we need to integrate in our lives. You know, as we saw, Martin had his struggle with <laughs> the nurse and everything else. Uh, so, and uh, Nathan Ball, who was a it was, uh, I don't think either of them was this necessarily a sexual relationship, but, but it was a very, very profound, you know, uh, effective relationship in both cases. 
And that's my final point uh, that I intimated earlier. That I think the gift of both men ultimately is their humanity. You know, to show that humanity is not uh, contrary to uh, our spirituality, getting in the way that here we who worship an incarnate God, supposedly, uh, realize that God is manifest in our incarnation, in our fleshliness, in our vulnerability, in our weakness, as the cross proves, as I said earlier. Uh, Father Dan Moran, in his, in his uh, 50th anniversary uh, mass, uh, of his death, of Martin's death uh, uh, a month or two ago, he said that himself. He said in his homily that he thinks Merton's greatest contribution in the end will not be his contemplative experience or his interfaith or his uh, social action, but it will be his humanity. You know, the testimony of his humanity and how that can inspire us and encourage us. And I think it's even clearer, uh, uh, without all the other gifts that get in the way, it's even clearer in Henry Nowen's case that that's, that, that is, that was and is, uh, great contribution that he, he continues to make as well by his life and by his writings. Okay. Thank you.